All right, so where the A7 electric banana, right? That kind of a love, love will do. The bluesy, all right? That's what the Lady Madonna is doing in the verses, okay? And actually, the FG, because that's being employed as wandering majors in a sense, what I talked about, that also implies blues. I, I, I think I mentioned in the last one that I had said to you something about wandering major chords and that they all wandering majors relate to the blues, and I couldn't figure out why, and then that night I had a revelation uh -huh. and I understood it. So that too, the FGA also implies it couldn't have existed without the blues having existed. Okay. okay. Now, but then the A7 all of a sudden becomes European. Because it's a 5 to 1 relationship to D minor. A7 to D minor. Okay. All right. D minor. Uh, A7 is 5 steps up from D. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, A. All right. 5 steps up. It's a 5 to 1 relationship. Even though in the key of... Uh, the, the D minor, you have to call temporarily a one, okay? Okay. Uh, it's kind of complex. This has to do with parallel and relative. I won't go into it. All right, so now what we got now. Da -da, da -da, da -da. This is all, now he's taking us to the key of C, even though it sounds like D minor. All right? All right. To isolate D minor, G, C, and A minor, all that movement, there's only one chord family template that those four chords could fit on. That's the C, C major family okay. template. Okay, so this is really kind of... It's a little tricky when you just turn... You, you, Ear-wise, we've moved into D minor. Right. Okay. But he keeps moving us through until finally... See, the D minor is the Dorian step of C. Okay? Okay. The Dorian root. All right? And we think we're in the Dorian root because it takes us right to that chord. Right. So we're thinking, oh, we're in D minor. But then he goes, all right, and then, no, the C is pulling the root now. So he goes, I mean, if you were to end this section as if this was the song itself. Yeah, right. but they surprise, he's, they surprise us. So really, the art of modulation in songwriting, the art of um, the art of modulation is about shifting the roots in a person's brain, where they hear the root. And remember I told you, there's a mystery to root. If I sit here and play a C-sharp minor after all these chords, and if I just sit here and talk to you, and I play a C-sharp minor, within seconds, our brain says, oh, that must be the root. Now watch. We all feel it. Oh, we're home. You know, yeah. it took us home. So, this is the art of of writing music, composing music in general, is the art of making roots, changing roots, and mm. making roots. Okay? okay. And you can hear this really clearly in like uh, the late cla uh, late uh, Romantic period uh, music. It happens all over, even Baroque, but late late Romantic really goes bananas with it in terms of shifting the roots all around. You listen to Wagner. Um, well, it's uh, late romantic I'm talking about. But, you know, people from that era, they, they wrote these really biggish kind of very, you know, soap opera kind of yeah. big music, but they were really, really working with tricking the ear into all these different roots and being really sinuous about huh. it. So finally, you could take somebody eventually into a route that's the furthest possible distance from the key and they won't even notice it, <laughs> you know. But there's a difference here between being subtle and being uh, heavy hammered on it, heavy handed on it. Yeah, yeah. You could do either. Remember, there. You know, I mean, aesthetic taste is aesthetic taste. You know, I, I have one student, very bad student. Um, you know, uh, and we'll talk about the minor ninth rule, and I, I'd say, oh, you know, you can't use a minor ninth because it sounds bad, and then I'll give an example. <laughs> say oh I like this sound though oh you know so I mean it's all a matter of taste eventually as a sure. composer it's just a matter of taste so there's you know I really want to stress the idea here that it's it's important and it's good to know music theory okay um, but really ultimately it comes down to your own final taste and what, what you like or don't sure. like and whether people like it or not it's up to them you know sure um, there's one little point I wanted to make about that too um, 
regarding taste in music and I total my brain just blanked out. So anyway, so uh, let's look at the C. Uh, C Um, so we've been taken to the key of C, so C is natural there at that point, you know. We've got D minor to G, C, A minor, D minor, G. Now we have to get back to A. And such a pretty way to get there. That C to B minor. That's a very McCartney-esque trick. He uses that in uh, Yesterday and other oh, okay, songs. Right. Where you have a root and you go down a half step to a minor chord. Now the minor chord alone isn't helping. All right? It isn't the whole um, modus operandi for getting back to A. All right? Although B minor belongs to the key of A, okay. we're still really entrenched in C. So what's this B minor doing here? It becomes um, justified by the next chord, E7. <laughs> That's a suspension, E7 suspended fourth, going to E7, okay? And you can hear the, feel the suspension, right? That, right? So, uh, basically what's happening here, it's kind of a jump out of the key of C. Let's see how far in... The, actually, it's interesting, I mean, the chord B minor, the closest possible key to C you'll find it in is G. The key of G has a B minor in it. Okay. All right, the key of C does not. It has a B uh, half diminished or a B uh, diminished, right? But the key of G is only one note difference from the key of C. So the B minor, although a jump, is not a big one, right? Huh. But B minor is also in the key of A as well as the key of G. Okay. B minor is the three chord in the key of G. B minor is the two chord in the key of A. Okay. All right. If I go up the scale, A, B minor, C sharp minor, well, here's our B minor. Remember I taught you how to do the chord family template on, on with bar chords? Right. Right? Well, B minor is the two chord of A, but right. if I take the key of G, it's the three chord of G. All right. Okay? So, <laughs> it's funny. This is how my brain goes. This is like, I don't think there's any <laughs> any musicians that think the way I do when it comes I, I take it down to its real detail. All right, and that's the Virgo in me, I guess. All right, but there's a, a relationship in jazz that they never stop talking about, and that's called the 2-5 relationship. And um, Joe Pass, for example, has a, a videotape for teaching guitar, and... Uh, the whole, the whole time he's just talking about how to move the two fives. That's all it's about. Really? Moving through two fives. And in jazz, that's essential. Mm. All right? I could go even further because five chords, you, you could do so much on these bad boys. So anyway, what is two five? Well, if I take the key of A, two is B minor. Okay. Three, four, five is E7. Two, five, one. All right? B minor, E7, A. So here we have C, B minor, E7, A. All right, there's the 2-5 relationship going back to A. And it could have felt really sudden, but, but since, the, since B minor is not a chord that's horribly far away in key from C, because I just demonstrated it's also right. in G, which is only a one-note difference from C, it doesn't sound like a huge leap. And if anything, it has a beautiful texture. Yeah, it does. off it by doing the suspension. Well, there's my girls. <laughs> I have a supermodel screensaver. All right, so, uh, all right. So that's uh, pretty much it for Lady Madonna. There's some lore about it. Um, this is uh, to show you how indolent the Beatles got with their power and uh, um, influence is that they, they realized we're the Beatles and we could play one note and make a 45 out of it and it'll be a hit single, you know. Because why? Because the Beatles. They mm. probably could have done something like that, you know. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if they ever put, I don't think they put Revolution 9 on the B side of a single, but it would have been hilarious if they did. <laughs> All right, so in any case, uh, 
there's this indolence, and you could hear it. You could hear it in the uh, actual production quality. Lady Madonna feels kind of like the White Album in production quality. It's not. It's not the the really um, precise, slick intonations and textures that that the Peppers had. You know, everything was just so meticulous. This, like, when you listen to the horns, it ba 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 ba, all that stuff. He's kind of joking around. So it's very white album. In fact, I don't think those real horns there at one point where he actually does it with his mouth. Okay. Ba, 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 all right. Ba, 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 ba. Uh, and he hired a sax player, a jazz saxes, to do this. And this is this is, goes to show you how indolent the Beatles got when they were doing Peppers and. Uh, also, going back to Ab going up to Abbey Road in the future, their last album, when they decided to make a real, what they called a real Beatles album, mm -hmm. after the the depression of Let It Be and the lack of, I don't know what, of the White Album, the bad mood of the White Album, they decided, well, it's not fair, let's give the public a real Beatles record. So what do they mean by that? Well, that means, like, we're going to take care to make all this stuff perfect. Okay. We're going to make it perfect. And if anything comes close to perfection, it is that record, Abbey Road. It's just remarkable. Ah. Well, now, I, a couple questions I have. First of all, is there any real, is there a real Lady Madonna, Lady Madonna that they were thinking yeah, about? He, he took the image, uh, the image was from a National Ge Geographic magazine. Uh, 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 I don't know what country in Africa it was, but some really impoverished country. There's okay. A, like a graphic photo of a Poverty, those, yeah, that sort of thing. Impoverished, starving people. Okay. And she had a baby at her breast, you know. So that was the, the initial okay. impetus for the song. Uh, anyway, I was going to say about the sax player, normally, you know, you go back to Peppers or go up to Abbey Road, McCartney would have sat down and, set, you know, he would have written out the part. Well, not, not on paper, but he would have figured out what the sax player is going to play. Because, you know, I want to make a good production of the song. He didn't have any friggin' idea. When the sax player came in, he had no idea what the, what the guy was going to do. Yeah. He just said, uh, play something in this section. <laughs> and he put this sax player through the hoops. <laughs> and that, that was, this is probably one of the side musicians that wound up walking away from the Beatles saying, I hate these guys. Yeah. He was really pissed off. He was very annoyed. Oh, man. He shouldn't have been. A, he was working with McCartney. Probably he was getting double union scale. He yeah. He should have complained. Yeah. You know, what the hell. Plus, good for his resume, I guess. Mm. <laughs> I'd love to be able to say, you know, I played this part on a yeah. Beatles record. Yeah, know? exactly. But, you know, back in those days, uh, you know, uh, the classical guys still had their noses up in the air at the Beatles. Uh, so it took a while, you know, when the theorists, people like Bernstein came along and said, you know what, yeah, Good Day Sunshine is an amazing piece of music, uh -huh. you know, that sort of thing. So that's uh, Lady Madonna. I don't think there's much else about it. We have... Uh, to, w to wind up that album, can I ask a, a question about... I don't know how long it took them to write all the stuff on this album. And, you know, I'm in that whole process of culling through stuff. And there there maybe was a bunch of stuff they put together, but they didn't use, whatever. But is there is there a chronology? Let's say it took them a year. To put uh, what album are you talking about? Now? This one. This is a single. Lady Madonna is a single. Okay. Oh, oh, oh that's right. Yeah. yeah. That's right. And the, the full album before that was what? Uh, a Magical Mystery Tour. Oh, right. Which that was the end of Psychedelia. That was kind of like the right. going out with a puff. The Magical yeah. Mystery Tour was. They had Yellow Submarine too. It was a silly record. Um, in fact, they were so so in need of material for that record that George Martin took a piece of his score from the Yellow Submarine uh, movie uh -huh. and put it on there, you know. So, wait, Lady Madonna was never in any album except for a Best Of or Beatles Top Ten or... Yeah, I don't think Lady Madonna even was on uh, on those excuses for albums like Yellow Submarine. It wasn't on there. Uh, huh. Uh, I wonder what was it. It has to be one of their... I mean, one of their bigger, more recognizable things. Well, uh, tunes, it was, it was it? a big hit. Yeah. It was a big hit. And actually, just after... Let me just check on the Beatles chronology here, because I'm thinking just after Lady Madonna. Hey, uh, yeah, this is still before the White Album is released. We have uh, Hey Jude and, and Revolution. Right. Revolution indeed was on the White Album, but Hey Jude was stood alone. So th both of those, Hey Jude and Lady Madonna, weren't on albums. Nope, and they're both McCartney songs. Okay. And in fact. Uh, 
I don't know if, if Revolution was the B-side of Hey Jude, but Lennon, Lennon was starting to get pissy around this period because uh, McCartney always beat him out on getting the A-sides on records at this point. In the early days, it was Lennon that was getting all the A-sides. Uh -huh. But Lennon didn't have much... Uh, he wanted... You know, you know, it's funny because like in the early days of the Beatles, they always called Lennon the boss of the Beatles. He was like the leader. And he always... He kind of like, what leader? We're a bunch of guys playing together. But the fact of the matter was, he, he was the leader of the band at that point. He formed the group. He was the guy behind it. And uh, he was an intense competition with McCartney. And he did a great job in his early days. He was hungry and, and writing. They're not hungry anymore. Yeah. But th thankfully, they still had a certain amount of integrity to their writing. You know, They got lazy, yeah. And they figured we could get away with anything, yeah. But they still had, you know, they had yeah. years of, of, of like incredible songwriting. They're not going to let that go in one well swoop, swoop just because they're smoking too much pot. Sure. sure. And interestingly, too, I wanted to mention, you know, we talked, you know, you seem to have a curiosity about when they went to India and what happened. The interesting thing is, they went to India just before the White Album. Now, you would think with all this Indian sounding stuff that uh -huh. Harrison was doing all this, or you mentioned we were doing, um, uh, what was it, uh, uh, Baby or Rich Man? Yeah. Uh, that you said like that that weird horn that's in there, that Indian influence again, and you yeah. thought it might be Harrison. That that's a gen might have been, you know. Yeah. Uh, but the thing was, like, Har it, it's kind of interesting because what they were doing back in those days was, yeah, Harrison became interested in Indian music through the Birds. Uh, uh -huh. Roger McGuinn started hipping him to to this stuff. So, uh, and also 12-string guitar. He, he was going for, you know, sonorous string sounds, oh. you know, textural. And uh, I'm, I'm sure he might have imported Ravi Shankar before he went to India. Huh. Uh, or, actually, i got to look at the history, because maybe he did go to India for lessons in the sitar. Okay. But basically, a lot of the Indian stuff they were doing was a projection and a, romantic, a romanticizing of India and Indian music. Yeah, probably, probably Indian musicians probably laughed at them. <laughs> Because oh, oh, yeah. it, it takes so many years for them to even learn to the tabla, to oh, 20 years. <laughs> was pissed off. Yeah. He was like, you know, you can't, like, put that on a record. You you know, I've, I studied this for years, and here you're yeah. planking away at a sitar and putting that on a record. Well, not only that, it has this, this sacred qualities about it. That sure, Indian sure. music is written for, specific, you know, morning chants, all this sort of thing. There's not much scientific about in, Indian music. It's... Um, they base their uh, their melodies on what are called ragas, mm -hmm. and a raga almost seems arbitrary. You could have like it's it's like maybe a five note scale or a six note scale or an eight note scale. It's not based on like real the real science that Pythagoras mm -hmm. straightened out in music. But uh, is a lot of it improvised? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's and most of it's it? jazz. It's okay. Jazz. Basically, you know, you, you what they do is they they uh, you're get, they'll take one of the many, many ragas. I don't know how many ragas there are, but they're like these mini scales. Right. And they can go up way, one way and down another. It's really bizarre, right? Huh. And they have ragas for the more, like, dawn. Exactly. Moods for all the ragas and there's meanings. So basically what they'll do is, it's kind of like a jazzer saying, okay, we're going to jam out in the Dorian mode A root. Let's go. Okay. Right? So it's based, like what Miles was doing, you know, in the 60s where he's just experimenting. You know, I, I heard rumors that like you know these guys were clueless you have got these incredible musicians behind them and they were clueless they didn't know what miles was doing because he'd say okay well uh. we're going to be an e minor let's let's play around the dorian thing mm -hmm. and it's like what you know where's the chart you know where's the melody line what well would they learn like let's take sitar for example would they learn like you would learn to play guitar and get to a certain level of mastery of it, and then you're turned loose. That that, you know, okay, you're on your own, you float. You do yeah, whatever yeah, you feel like on it. Absolutely. And so Indian musicianship was, you have to learn the ragas in and out. The technique was really important, like yeah, really, right. really meticulous. You know, like it would, became like a discipline, probably more intense than our, our European classical tradition even. 